My name is Sam Vaknin, and I am the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. The Trump Revolution The supporters and fans of Donald J. Trump are frustrated. In 1939, a team of psychologists, led by John Donald, hypothesized that frustration always leads to aggression. Legitimate grievances against a dysfunctional, corrupt, and compromised polity, a deceptive ethos, an American dream turned nightmare, a broken system that no longer works for the overwhelming majority and appears to be unfixable, all these lead Trump's base to feel that they had been betrayed, abandoned, duped, exploited, abused, ignored, disenfranchised, and trampled upon. They are in the throes of dislocation, disorientation, and trauma. The declining fortunes of the people who support Trump, their obsolete skills, render them insignificant and irrelevant, and their lives meaningless. It is hopelessness, coupled with impotent helplessness, that is the engine behind Trump's ascension. Trump's adulators seek to bypass the system, and even to dismantle it altogether. They don't want to reform it. They want it gone. This is the stuff revolutions are made of, and the pronouncements of Trump's cohorts are inadvertently copy-pasted from the texts of the French Revolution, the October Revolution, which led to Bolshevism, and even the Nazi Revolution. Such conditions often give rise to cults centered around a narcissistic or psychopathic leader figurehead. In trust, the abyss between his life's circumstances and his followers is unbridgeable. And yet, they hope that by associating with him, however remotely, some of his glamour and magical fairy tale success will rub off on them. Voting for Trump is like winning the lottery, becoming a part of a juggernaut and of history. It is an intoxicating sensation of empowerment that Trump encourages by telling his voters that they are no longer average, that they are now, by virtue of following him, great and special, even if only by proxy and vicariously. Trump Trump idealizes his voters, condescendingly, but still idealizes them, and they return the favor. In their eyes, he is the cleanser of the Beltway's Augean stables. He, single-handedly, in ten minutes, in his words, will destroy the, their ancien regime, the old order, of which he had been a part since age 21, may I remind you. He, the Trump, will settle scores, dirty Harry style, and thus make their day. It is a nihilistic mindset. Some of his followers gleefully contemplate the suspension of the Constitution and its elaborate checks and balances. Others discuss openly and fervently and hopefully a war with China and Russia. Yet some others compare him to the first Roman emperors. These people behind Trump wish to unburden themselves by transferring their decision-making and responsibilities onto the chosen one, the great leader. To his acolytes, and contrary to much evidence, Trump is a doer with a long list of mostly illusory accomplishments. He is best equipped to get things done and to prioritize, they say. In Washington, where appearances matter far more than substance, no one is better credentialed than the Donald, they smirk. These champions of small government and conservatism look to Trump when president, in other words, they look to the state, to generate jobs, to insulate them from the outside world, to protect them from illegal aliens and terrorists, surely one and the same, and in general to nanny and cosset them all the way to the bank. 
The world, they say, is a hostile, psychopathic place. And who best to deal with it than an even more hostile, narcissistic leader like Trump? We need a bad big wolf to navigate through the jungle out there, they exclaim. And this is a form of collective regression to toddlerhood, with Trump in the role of the omnipotent, omniscient father. In abnormal psychology, this is called shared psychosis. The members of the cult deploy a host of primitive, infantile, psychological defense mechanisms as they gradually dwindle into mere extensions and reflections of their skipper. Theirs is a malignant optimism, grounded not in reality, but in idealization, a tendency to interact not with Trump himself, but with an imaginary Trump that each fan tailors to suit his or her fears, hopes, wishes, and fervent fantasies. And then there is, of course, denial, pathological response, the repression of inconvenient truths about Trump and their relegation to the unconscious, where they fester into something called dissonance. Dissonance breeds rage and violence, and these oft accompany nihilistic and destructive political cults. Denial goes well with splitting. The demonization and denigration of opponents and adversaries, critics and bystanders, and sometimes innocent interlocutors. If you are not 100% with us, you are 1000% against us. And if you are against us, you are the enemy to be sucker punched and carried out on a stretcher. Trump's words. One such fantasy Trump actively encourages is that he is just acting to the crowds now. He's below the belt obnoxiousness, is just for show. In a feat of rationalization worthy of Houdini, Trump's legions attribute his crass boorishness to market research and reasoned electoral calculus. Once elected, he will miraculously be transformed into a presidential and dignified politician who plays by the rules and is by no means buffoonish, vulgar, and offensive. These people insist with a knowing wink as though they have ever truly been in the know, as though they are pals with the, and buddies with the great man himself. Such intimations of arcane knowledge cater to their growing sense of self-importance. Indeed, Trump's may well be the first postmodern narcissistic mass movement. Such admirable thespian skills attribute to Trump and proudly owned by him Required, required the inbred personality of a consummate and thoroughly psychopathic con artist. Narcissists affect these transitions between different selves and different guises and different masks and different personas effortlessly. And this is precisely because they have only a false self, no true self. They only have a confabulated grandiose image that they project, and which has very little to do with reality. The sole aim of the, the false self is to garner narcissistic supply. Attention, if possible, unmitigated admiration and adulation, power, money. Faking it is second nature to, to the narcissist. Exaggerating, lying, pretending, shape-shifting, zealot-like, chameleons, whatever it takes, Everything is negotiable. Another fantasy is that the narcissist will never turn against his own people. Trump will mercilessly crush the coterie of corrupt power brokers in Washington, but will never ever direct the full might of his gratuitous sadism against his own followers, fans, ardent supporters, and fawning admirers. So they say. History, of course, teaches otherwise. Sooner or later, the narcissist cannibalizes his own power base and treats as enemies his most rabid lackeys and toadies. People shrug and say, but ain't all politicians narcissistic? So what? Who cares? Well, the answer is a resounding no. Not all politicians are, nar are narcissists, malignant narcissists. Many of them are narcissistic, but not all of them are malignant narcissists. Granted, it would be safe to assume that most politicians have narcissistic traits. 
But as the great psychologist Theodore Millen observed, there is a world of difference between being possessed of a narcissistic style and being a full-fledged, malignant, dangerous, destructive narcissist. The famous author Scott Peck suggested that narcissism may just be a modern-day fancy byword for evil. He said that narcissism is another word for evil. Scott Peck may have had a point, but evil should be contained and eradicated, not elevated to the position of the free leader of the free world.